During the night, a cold rain covers the protagonist and an unknown girl. The drops fall on the girl and she, with an emotionless face, tells him that she is happy to die with him. The beautiful girl seen earlier is dancing gracefully. The protagonist is sitting in his office admiring a video clip of the girls. He is obviously lonely, but that doesn't make him sad in the least. Our hero's name is Reiji, we learn from the fact that he is called into the room. Called by a certain teacher called Shinoba. Keep this character in mind, he will play a good role in this manga in the future. Shinoba tells Kuroz to sit down, and then asks him about his hopes for employment, since his grades show that he's obviously going to a private college. Reiji tells Shinoba that he cannot leave this town. The teacher talks about his family, his family being his mother, his older brother, his grandmother and himself, Reiji. The teacher asks Reiji about his brother. His brother comes from a distant background. His grandmother is also cognitively impaired. Reiji's mother does a lot of things while working as a nurse. Reiji says that he wants to start working earlier and make his life a little easier. Shinoba's teacher doesn't think so, she suggests that Reiji should talk to his mother. Maybe she wants Reiji to continue his studies? This question worries Shinoba. The street. Reiji is run over by a pedestrian, all the inhabitants don't understand what's wrong with the weather, they think the typhoon is coming because of the typhoon. Reiji says goodbye to the people we don't know and gets on the bus. First Reiji looks at the beautiful fields of his town, then he takes out his wired headphones and puts them in his ears. He switches on the idol group acrylic. Meanwhile, a slightly overweight girl enters the bus and takes one of the earphones out of the protagonist's ears. Her name is Chaco, we find out when the protagonist talks to her. She realizes that Ray is also interested in acrylic. They get off the bus and Chaco blurts out that she wants to go to Tokyo for an acrylic concert. Chaco starts a discussion about how someone who was kind in a past life would have been Aoe Jinagi. And Chaco herself was definitely a villain, having been born in that godforsaken place. A fat, dwarfed, ugly, stubbly, short-sighted otaku. That's exactly what Chaco claims. 100% evil, like the one who killed 30 people in Tsuyama. Rei has no idea who she's talking about. Chaco says that in her next life she will definitely be a beautiful girl in Tokyo, because she is smart, number one among high school girls in the prefecture. She has many favorite things to do and is always having fun. Rei asks Chaco if she got into an institute in Tokyo, but Chaco is happy to report that she passed all her exams at Wazita. Rei is happy for her and rejoices. Chaco asks where Rei is going next, and he replies that today was orientation, so he says that he wants to get results in this city. The wind picks up and Chaco asks Rei if he has thought about leaving the city. After all, there are many different circumstances, such as marital status. She turns around, smiles and says that his life is his property. Rei is taken aback by Chaco and is in complete shock. He thanks her and says she's right. Two women approach our heroes and ask if a certain suicide chasm is far away. Rei doesn't understand, but Chaco is happy to show her the way. The two women thank them. Chaco says that these ladies are on a sacred pilgrimage from Asmori Kosaku's spring coffin. Rei asks, what is that? Chaco is an otaku who reads a lot of manga. She says that as a true fan of Asmori Kosaku, she has a whole shelf of his books. Rei says he doesn't read novels, and Chuck explains, Suicide Abyss is a legend, the book says that everyone in this town will one day jump into the water and never come up again. It's more like a folk rave, a suicide rave. About suicide by conspiracy. At the beginning of the Edo period, a traveler wandered into a village in the mountains. Because of her beauty, she fell in love with the men of the village, and there was one with whom everything was mutual. The other villagers became very jealous and began to interfere with the lovers. The villagers would not let them leave the village or marry. Finally, during a night storm, the lovers jumped into the river. The place where their bodies were dumped was called Suicide Chasm. That's where the novel is set. Now it's become something of a pilgrimage site. Maybe this manga will be made into a film. Chaco even teases that they could call this town Suicide Pride and then their backwater would be revitalized. The heroes decide to keep their heads down. Ray gets a message that there are guests, and the sender also sends a cigarette. He tells Chaco that he has to leave. Chaco realizes it's Maneji Shikuin and gives him the bill. She says she only wants to pay back her debt. She asks Ray if he has paid back enough. He slowly replies, let's not break our bond. He asks, what do you think, Chaco? And thanks her, then leaves. Ray goes to a supermarket and buys Night Star's cigarettes. 
It's dark, Ray goes into a strange place where he's waved to by a man he doesn't know. Ray gives him a pack of cigarettes, this guy is Minajeshi, and he seems to be bullying our hero. Minajeshi asks where another pack of cigarettes is, to which Ray apologizes with a smile. One of Minajeshi's friends asks him who it is, Minajeshi replies that it's just a childhood friend, while asking Ray if that's true. Ray, suppressing his feelings, says yes, he tells his childhood friend to hurry up and sends him off to get cigarettes again. He goes to the shop and asks to be sold 9 stars cigarettes again. He reaches out to confirm his age, but the clerk says they don't sell to people in uniform. Ray is startled as it's the first time she's ever spoken. Chuck tells Gino that they won't sell to him because he's in uniform, but he just says he needs three more packs. The hero remembers protecting Chaco when he was a kid, and he thinks it's not help, it's a favor. Chaco will pay his debt and go to Tokyo without hindrance, and the hero will serve Gino as king in that city. Forever, this debt. Ray returns home, to a two-story building. One of the flats in this building is his family's flat. His mother greets him with a smile, telling him that she changed his grandmother's nappy and where to wipe it. He hears his brother getting angry at their mother and hitting him. His mother comes in and asks Ray Kuhn to go get some chicken, and asks him to run to the store quickly. Ray agrees and says he'll also get a bento box. Ray's mother thanks Ray and says she would have died without him. Ray says goodbye to her. The street. Dark night. Street lights. He's standing at the suicide chasm. He wonders if he jumps, will he die? After all, the lovers jumped into the river during the night storm. Their bodies were found here, hence the name Suicide Chasm. He arrives at the same shop where he tried to buy cigarettes and sees the shop assistant leaving the shop. He sees a man following her and thinks it's dangerous, so he follows. He sees the girl giving the bento to a homeless man who didn't sell it. The homeless man walks away and winks at him. The girl lights a cigarette and says he must have changed into street clothes, Ray says well. Is he a student? The girl says he only has to smoke once. The girl gives the boy a light and the boy looks at the girl's face. He remembers where he saw her before, it's Aoi Nagi. He asks her if it's true. Aoi didn't think anyone would know me in a place like this. She thinks the guy is an idol connoisseur. He asks what she's doing in a place like this. Aoi says it's a secret. She puts a cigarette in Ray's mouth and lights it with her own. She tells him to inhale, he inhales, exhales. The fire is lit. The boy stands with a cigarette between his teeth. His death has begun. Acrylic is a group of four people. The average age of the members is 17 and a half. Although they are not yet media personalities, they are slowly gaining popularity, with Aoi Nagi standing out as particularly beautiful. It's Chaco's explanation that Ray remembers. Ray doesn't understand what an idol is doing in her town, why she works around the clock. AoE says he seems docile and quiet, but he also knows her band. It turns out that he didn't come to get cigarettes for himself. Ray tells her about a friend who knows the AoE dolls well. Ray says that if they met, Chaco would die of jealousy. But that's why it's a secret, AoE informs him. Ray reminds him that he has to hurry, he has to fulfill a request, but he would like to talk to her longer. AoE stops him, asking him to keep what he saw a secret. It's about the man she gave the bento to and something else. It's her first time working part-time at a convenience store, and they throw away more bentos than you can eat. So she doesn't really feel like she's doing anything wrong. Ray mentions that he needs to buy a bento box too, so AoE suggests he take one. She is pleased and asks him to choose one, smiling at him as she does so. Ray can't believe what is happening. Ray sees the fried chicken and wants to have it too. AoE says it's dirty, but he stands his ground and says he'll go, his brother will eat it. AoE asks if it's too much, does he really hate his brother? Ray tells her he's distant, needs to stock up. He's now punching the wall of the house and continues to shout at his mother. Finally, AoE asks him to tell her his name, and of course Ray does. She asks if he's free that night and then asks him to show her around the house. Ray acts strangely and asks for permission. She smiles and tells him to stop, because she's the one asking. Ray is over the moon, treating it as a date and immediately thinking about his appearance. He gets home and sees his mother sitting outside. She says it's too noisy at home. Ray apologizes for being late. Ray's mother apologizes for what happened. Ray says it's okay. He also tells his mother that he's going for a walk. She tells him that Minigashi's father has asked him if he will work for him as chief designer after Ray finishes school. He says he hasn't heard anything, so where's all this talk coming from all of a sudden? She also thought Ray might be the chief designer. 
In this town, if you work all the time, you live in security to be personally invited by the director is a great honor for an employee. Ray's thoughts on the design position, Ray arrives for his date with AoE, apologizes for being late and says he will leave his bike somewhere nearby. She asks, why leave it anywhere? We see them riding together through the city at night. Ray looks happy, he asks where he's going? AoE doesn't know anything here, she asks him to show her the places he usually goes. He takes her to a street where all the shops are lined up in rows. At the end of the street is Ryan, and the locals mostly walk along the street our heroes are driving along. AoE thinks that Tokyo is quite inconvenient, there's so much going on, and Ray mentions that her friend, who is an expert on idols, keeps saying that there's nothing going on in this shithole. Ray makes a sharp turn and asks her to go back, it's all because of his childhood friend he sees ahead. AoE realizes that they turned back because of the people he bought cigarettes for. Ray remarks that she understands, besides their leader is his childhood friend. Ray thought they were good childhood friends. She says that as long as they are in this town, they can't break that bond. And Ray, with a sad face, says that he will never break it. He talks about his worries, that when he finishes school, he will work as a chief designer. AoE asks him if that's what he wants to do, to which he replies that he would never want to do that. But the dilemma is that Ray can't leave the city, because even if he had AoE's talents, he wouldn't want to do anything. AoE asks Ray why he talks about such different things since they met. Ray replies that it's probably because he's someone who will never leave this town. He smiles at AoE and says he'll never forget how they used to cycle and walk together, as AoE looks down at her, talking about how the headwaters of this river have become famous because of a recent affair, the suicide chasm. Ray knows about this, he tells her that the otaku friend told her about this place, Ray says she doesn't know the contents. The lovers jumped into the river together after the ascension, by conspiracy. The characters in the novel did the same thing, Ray says it's interesting, but AoE interrupts and doesn't say a word. But she says it's an enviable fate, because it's a happy death. Silence, a dark sky and a beautiful river. Suddenly, AoE suggests that Ray climb up. Ray is confused and tells him that it is too sudden. AoE asks if he wants to. After all, his life has been boring so far. Suddenly there is the sound of an engine, a bus passing them. Adol had made a double ascent with a schoolboy. This news can hit the headlines in a day. Ray doesn't know if she's serious. Until now, he's only lived, he's not sure if he's capable of more. If you're going to die with an idol, you should enjoy life at the very end. AoE replies that it would be a shame to die at the very end, and then reaches out his hand and calls the protagonist to his house. Ray thinks that if he dies with AoE Nagi, then, he will be happy. Ray remembers AoE talking to him, and now he sees the beautiful girl in his bed. The apartment, the lights are on. AoE and Ray kiss, her tongue is so soft, Ray finally understands what a kiss is. AoE realizes that our hero is still a virgin loser, asks him about it and offers him a bath. Ray can't believe what's happening, he thinks she's just playing with him. AoE puts on the clothes from her last debut, she asks him if he realizes that he's going to do it with an idol. She pulls him into bed and he grabs her breasts. He is still in shock that it is Nagi AoE. He tries to begin to process what has happened, but his excitement prevents him from doing so. Ray apologizes and AoE tells him to address her as you. We learn AoE's age, she's 20 years old. Ray says she's pretty serious, she's never been told not to buy cigarettes before. AoE says everyone tells her she's stupid, and she's sincere. Ray laughs and says that being stupid goes against her image. Ray asks her to take off her clothes, her blouse is rough and uncomfortable, and her shoes are cold too. Besides, he wants to reel her. They do it. After the whole process, they lie on the bed together and Reiji sees the fish and talks about how lonely she is. AoE says his name is Nagi, just like hers. She offers him a drink and tells him to get one from the fridge, and Reiji is about to ask her if she wants anything when the homeless man AoE has been feeding comes out. AoE says he promised he'd be somewhere else today, to which he replies that he lives here too. Ray asks for him, and he turns out to be her husband. Nagi's husband sends him to get dressed, AoE apologizes for saying he wouldn't be here today. Ray runs off and gets dressed at the same time. What the hell is going on? She tricked me? Why would she do that? Why? Nagi AoE is married, to the homeless guy? Betrayal. It's just an affair? Is this the first time it's happened? He doesn't understand anything. Nothing at all. He thinks back to AoE's offer to ascend, he doesn't realize if it's a joke or not. 
If no one had interrupted them, right now, would they be standing here? He makes it home, gets into bed, takes out his mobile phone and looks at the video of the girl. He looks at her body and realizes that he had it with Nagi Aoi, with a real idol. He just has to get it into his head. The morning begins with Grandma wishing everyone a good morning, and his Cretan brother yells a swear word about how good it is. Grandma is taken to a daycare center. The woman tells him that they will take care of Grandma and then they leave. Ray is upset because his legs hurt and his mother's legs hurt. And her legs are always swollen, and her shoulders, and her neck, everything hurts. She wishes she could feel a bit better. Ray hopes she'll hold out until he finds a job. He mentions AOES offer again. Ray's mother asks him where her bike is, but he has left it at Nagi's. He starts to lose his way and thinks of something when he hears something ringing. Ding, ding, ding. The homeless man arrives at their house. He greets Ray's mother, who is surprised and asks if she knows him. The homeless man's name is Navo. He was Yuko's classmate in middle school. Navo comes to return Ray's bike, which he announces loudly to the family. Ray starts to freak out and thinks he's finished, but Navo decides to lie, he says he was in a hurry and that Ray borrowed it. He lies that he asked him to wait and that he left. While he was thinking about what to do, he noticed a sign that said Yuko Kuroz, the name of Ray's mother. So he came here, thinking he was Yuko's son, and he turned out to be right. He asks the main character's name and thanks him for yesterday. Ray doesn't know what he means, Yuko asks Navo if he's on holiday, to which he replies that it's only a temporary shelter, he's been here for half a month. Navo says goodbye to the characters and apologizes for disturbing them at this hour. Ray's mother asks if he met him by chance, and Ray replies that he did. AoE asks him not to get involved with him, as he is a bad man. It's raining outside, Ray sits in school and wonders why Nagi AoE is married to his mother's classmate. Does that mean he's 46 and she's 20? Turns out she's married to someone 26 years her senior. Nagi is married to an evil man? He is beckoned to go home. They have been dismissed early that day because the typhoon is approaching, they have to go to the shelter. Ray walks through the streets and comes to the edge of the abyss. He doesn't want to go home, but he has no money. He doesn't know what to do. He imagines AoE standing next to him, offering to do the ascent again. Ray's friend Chaco apparently finds him and shouts that it's dangerous. Only a child would look down from a bridge during a typhoon. She invites him over to her place to eat scones and read manga. Ray agrees. At the same time, Chaco takes him to his home and his father's shop, all of which are closed due to the approaching typhoon. Chaco invites him in through the back door because her parents are scolding her for being alone with a guy. They used to come over early when they were kids. Why are they talking about it now? Chaco takes off her tights, she's disgusted, her feet are all wet. Chaco yells at Ray because she thinks he thinks her legs are fat. She asks if he's okay. He's a bit weird today. Ray says he's fine. Chaco shows him the short story she told him about, it's called Spring Coffin. He looks at the author and sees. AoE's husband? It's Navo. Ray remembers AoE saying that Chaco was an interesting man. He asks what Navo is like, Chaco replies that she loves his books very much but he seems to have problems as a person. She remembers that he was recently divorced because of an affair with an actress who became famous. Worst of all, one of his mistresses overdosed and died. Chaco says he's a bastard, someone you shouldn't meet in real life. Why didn't Ray think of this before? Why does Nagi AoE wants to die? That was the first time Ray heard kind words. She's an idol, a guide to take him to heaven. Or is that what Ray thought? After all, she's the one with a reason to die. Chaco saw the news that Nagi AoE is taking an indefinite break. It says it's so she can focus on her mental health. Chaco laments that Nagi took a break for nothing, since she has become so famous. She was born beautiful, how could she leave then? Everyone was singing her songs. But after a moment, oh, she just says she has to find another girl to follow her. He imagines her as a lonely doll in a fishbowl, and Ray thinks about how lonely she is and how AoE has suffered all her life. No one understood her. It's too early to speculate. He thinks of the Nagi fish and how AoE told him about it. This fish is just as lonely in an aquarium, it suffers just like its owner. Ray says goodbye to Chaco and goes home. The typhoon is still raging outside, and Ray wonders what will happen when she is here. Ray meets Gon. He gets out of Mingeshi's company transport and goes to the shop. Ray is worried that if they realize that Adel is in this town something terrible will happen. Jen takes him under his arm and tells his colleagues that Ray will be working with them when you graduate. These guys will be responsible for him. 
they tell him to train while he can. Gon tells him that they will all be his mentors, so he should listen to what they have to say. He scolds him, saying that his mother must have begged his father for Gon's father to hire him. Gon offers to get along with them, at least at work, for the sake of their friendship. He remembers his mother's news that she had found a job for him, in his mother's mysterious tiredness. He realizes that he must do his best. He smiles and says he looks forward to working with them. Ray notices AoE watching him from around the corner of the shop. She starts towards the entrance of the shop, but Ray intercepts her and grabs her arm. He pulls her arm off and runs off with her. Gon watches as Ray runs off with Io, listening to his colleague's words. The typhoon is still raging and raining. Our protagonist apologizes to Ajao for his impertinence, he had stolen it while he was working. Ao silently takes off his sweatshirt and lets it go, the sweatshirt flies far away and Ao declares with a smile on his face that it's a great day to die. Ray asks Nagi if she knows where the abyss of love is? Io doesn't know where it is. But that's not what your husband wrote about, Ray asks her, to which she interjects what he said and then says they should go upriver as it's still shallow. Ray asks why she should die with him, Nag Dash? He interrupts, seeing Gon's car and then remembering what happened in the shop car park. He yells at him that he's not going to work for his daddy. He will die today, and he will be king of this town forever. He doesn't care anymore, shouts that they'll see each other again, and waves him off. He shuts up. Ha ha. Ha 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 ha. He starts to laugh. He always wanted to grow up, something clicked in his brother and now he's going mad. Grandma has just started to degenerate, he thought they could do something together, that they would get through this with his mother. He has always been told that everything is the way it should be. It wasn't his fault that his brother failed his exams, he was always told that he was smarter, or that the hero was just stupid. He didn't want to look after his grandmother, she doesn't love him. They forced him, told him they wanted to die. They wanted to relax. They would always ask Ray to buy whatever his brother wanted. They didn't even think about him. They told him to clean up after his grandmother when he came home from school. But the chair just looked clean. He's sure they were just waiting for him to come back, just for that. He's sure that they know that he's a gone slave, and that they even said that they didn't ask his daddy for anything. AoE takes his hand and asks why they can't just leave everything behind. Why don't they just run away from the city? He never thought about it. But why not? It's your life after all, Reiji, AoE says with a smile on his face. Ray remembers Chaco's words. He asks what she would do if he said he didn't want to die with her. She lets go of his hand and says she would just go on and die. But why does she want to die? AoE has no reason to want to die like Ray. She just has no reason to live. She's not here now, even if AoE leaves town, she won't show up, she won't find her. They stop at the shore, AoE is tired. Ray asks permission to hug her one last time and then asks permission to touch her breasts. She lifts her top and asks if Ray wants someone to love him. He relishes the moment and tells AoE, who replies that she wants nothing more either. He thanks Ray for coming to the city. It's a sunny day. We're moved into Ray's classroom. Everyone is discussing the typhoon and how it wasn't that serious. The teacher takes roll call and everyone realizes that our hero, Ray, is not present. One of the students asks how the teacher got those scars. She replies that she fell yesterday. The students scoff. A former pro baseball player in her 30s isn't the same, but she's only 29, she replies. She walks out of the office and looks into the sun, the bright sunlight blinding her, and she remembers. Past events, a typhoon. She is on the phone and reports that they let the kids go early because of the typhoon, but she makes sure none of the kids are left outside. She is asked to be careful and then says goodbye. She throws her phone on the back seat and she is already anticipating tasting the alcoholic booze at home. She notices a bag in the road and gets out, switching on her torch to see who's there. She notices Garose. She sees him holding hands with the same girl idol. She yells that he better step back and starts to climb down to save the student, and of course she falls herself. She screams that she's about to fly into the water, but is saved by the idol girl who is with Garose. Aoi Nagi, the idol girl, declares to Kuroz that they better do it next time. The teacher yells for the girl to stop. She asks if she did it with her student. Kuroz silently takes her hand and falls down. He starts crying and asks her to just stay out of it. The teacher realizes that her student really wanted to die with this girl. She changes her face and asks him to come with her. She will listen to whatever he tells her. The student calls Sheba 
our teacher. The student tells her that her boyfriend is always being rude to her. He made her eat a red pill. Sheba replies that she needs to stop wasting her time with guys. The student asks her, has Sheba never wasted time on such things? Sheba doesn't even understand what a red pill is and realizes that some things change very quickly. The students at this school are growing up very fast. Apparently, she's going to stay as innocent as she was before. She sees Reiji Kuros. She thought he was the last one like her. Chapter 9 On the Night of the Storm We go back to past events. Still, the typhoon is passing through. The teacher is looking at Kuros. Apparently, she is in pain that such a student tried to commit suicide. She quirks a sigh and talks about it. She's confident that she's doing the right thing. She didn't let him in at all. She can't let that happen in her class. She brings him back to her house. She tells him to go take a shower. She once again asks him to tell him everything that happened, and if he doesn't she will tell his parents. He takes off his shirt and Sheba glares at him. She gives him clothes, but says she doesn't have boxer. She remembers that she needs to change too, and is going to do so. She wants a shower too. Usually when she arrives after work she washes up and goes for a drink. She notices that she's hurt herself and realizes that if Nagi hadn't saved her, she would have died. If they love each other so much that they would die like that. I guess that's the type of relationship they have. She remembers his back, his body parts so childlike. She remembers it's like a love of his. She clutches herself and doesn't know why she's so worried. She realizes she needs to recover. The rain outside the window beats down on their house, and the teacher brings water to a student. She tries to get him to talk. She tries to find out why he did it, why he tried to die. Suddenly the student interrupts her and forgives her to get off her back. He says he's going to drop out of school and won't study anymore. She is very angry with him, but her anger is interrupted by the student. He talks about how she hurt herself. He apologizes. She dramatically softens. She asks him to stop apologizing. She tells him how she feels. She was very surprised to see him in that situation. She asks him to never scare her like that again. With a smile on her face, she asks him to try to throw the weight off his shoulders together, but the hero tells her that his weight will die with him, asks the teacher not to interfere anymore, and asks if she wants to join him. The teacher sits in the classroom. She remembers Ray yelling at her. He doesn't understand why she interfered with him. After all, he almost jumped. He almost finished his suffering. The teacher is scared. She doesn't understand if Kuroz is the real Kuroz in front of him. She clutches the rug and asks him what he's talking about. She explains to him that he has a way to go. He's 17. He's having a hard time. But he clearly has a future. Kuroz interrupts her. He has nothing. He has no future as a teacher. The atmosphere gets hotter. Silence in the room. Sighs. The phone in his bag rings. Kuroz feels gagging and runs to the sink. His well-being doesn't allow him to answer. All the tension comes with the dreaded phone calls. Kuroz is just asking for help from the teacher. Up, how much he sucks. Recalls a conversation. She is asked are her students great? She says yes, they are easy to get along with. But that's how most students are nowadays. They get into a discussion about how good students just need to be connected and helped along the way. But when you think about it, she doesn't even remember the teacher's face. They talk to each other. When you're old and lonely, before you realize it, and you don't want to live in this town alone, right? The teacher was approached with this question. She's afraid to be alone. We're being moved back. The phone is still ringing. The student is still in bad shape. The teacher changes her mind. She declares that it's okay. Kuroz may not answer. She will protect him. She sends him to bed. There is still a storm raging outside the window at this time. She tells him that he may not go to school. But in return, he must stay here. She wishes him a good night and tells him to rest. Kuroz remembers Nagi, her words that they will do it next time. The hero is devastated. But when? With these thoughts, our hero falls asleep. The teacher meanwhile is in the shower. She can't believe what is happening. Now she is a support. And right now nothing can be changed. She gets out of the shower and goes to Kuroz. She walks up to him and strokes his head and starts smiling evilly. Next morning, the hero realizes where he is. It's Sensei's house. He arrives in the kitchen where a delicious breakfast is already waiting for him. She smiles and asks him to just have a refreshment. The hero wanted to do the irreparable yesterday, but now he is hungry. 
His mom calls him again after he fell asleep. The teacher promises to help him. The teacher texts that he went to a friend's house and can't leave because of the storm. He decided to stay the night. She says goodbye to him and asks him to be a good boy. He closes the door and looks at his phone. He wants to apologize for what he wanted to do, but ends up erasing it. It's okay. Sensei just wants to help him. The teacher is sitting in the bathroom looking at what to make for lunch. She realizes she should be helping him instead of looking for something to make him for lunch. Mama Era texts him and she asks her if she's coming home tomorrow. She also suggests that she has lunch at her place. The teacher replies that she has things to do this weekend and can't come because of them. Era's mom replies that okay, that's bad, but try not to drag your work home. The teacher wants to write a post about Mama Era putting work before family, not her. She asks people to watch the kids even though she has the day off herself. She smiles fearfully but ends up erasing the message. She bought everything she needs for cooking and also clothes for Kuro's. She checks out of the store and is about to drive home. Ever since high school, she hasn't wanted to go home like this. Back then she was pretty exhausted from basketball, but now she doesn't realize it herself because Kuro's is a student, an unstable student who tried to throw himself into the river with a girl. She's afraid he's messed with her again, but still the teacher is the only one who can help him. She arrives home, rings the bell and Kuro's greets her. The teacher is surprised that he is wearing his uniform, but Kuro's only replies that it is dry, which is why he is wearing it. The teacher says that she already bought him a sweater and suggests he put it on. He refuses and says he will go home. He says he doesn't want to, but he has to go home. The teacher interrupts him. She's angry. She just can't believe it. Just yesterday, he wanted to die, but today he's going home safely. She asks him again about that girl, and isn't she the one he was going to see? She asks him to stay here, clinging to him and asking him not to leave, and after just kissing him. The teacher, after kissing Kuroz, immediately pushes him away. She falls on her knees and asks him to forgive her. She asks him not to tell anyone about it and that it wasn't what he thought it was. She asks him to pretend it never happened. She can't let him go home alone. She just can't let her student get killed. Kuroz agrees, then he apologizes to her. She says that she doesn't want Kuroz to apologize. She just wants to make him dinner. Kuroz remembered. A couple times he tried to leave, to leave and go to her. But every time he grabbed the doorknob, he heard Sensei's voice and remembered her words of help. He thought living in this town made her happy, but he was wrong. The teacher's train of thought begins to flow. She wonders when it started. Year after year, she got bored of teaching the same thing. It wasn't like anyone remembered her lessons after graduation. She spent her days trapped in them. Explain, write, repeat, trap, and that no one would remember. And then she would come home, suffering from loneliness, she would do the same thing wash and eat. She always brought her work home. The principal scolded and bullied her every year. She stopped wearing a skirt to school because he told her that her legs were not suitable for students in their prime and that she was only embarrassing herself. It's getting harder and harder for her to be a club advisor, not because she's getting older, but because the students are doing because they can. Club is just their hobby. They have no straight eye. When her friends see these girlfriends at the store, they laugh. They joke about how she doesn't have anyone else yet. She wants to be clean, so she doesn't wear makeup. She doesn't sleep around. Her friends already have kids, but she's jealous of them. Jealous? She puts her all into it. She's smart. She's good at sports, and she's good at her job. It's all just ruining her. She's never gonna get married or have a normal birthday party in a town like this. She starts laughing. Kuroz may want to die, but the teacher, inside, there's an abyss too. Kuroz calls out to her, calling her sensei, but she asks him not to call her that. She asks to take off his uniform. She just can't look at it. He takes off his clothes and turns around. He sees her naked, her empty eyes saying one thing, it's okay if you die. She won't get in his way. She allows it, but this time, Kuroz wants to put on birth control, but she says it's okay. She's already taken the red pill. Teacher has always lived an honest life. All her life she's been going downhill. She's been lost for a long time, and now she's the lost one on a dark, twisted path. Kuroz and her make love, 
When it's over, the teacher finds out it's happening so fast. The teacher meanwhile finds out that the idol girl is not Kuroza's partner at all. The teacher is shocked. She asks Kuroza if he can die just at the request of someone. He says yes. He doesn't care how he escapes. She takes his head and holds it to her. She calls his name. She asks him not to die, but to live, Kuroza. She will help him. She is head over heels in love with him. She asks him not to see the girl again and kisses him. They do this again. Meanwhile, Tiako, the protagonist's girlfriend, calls him and doesn't understand why he doesn't answer. She assumes it's because of last night, but doesn't think many Jeshi called him. She opens the manga and starts reading it. She talks about how this city is like a prison. He wants her dead. We learn that this manga is all erotica. She's glad Ray's not touching her library, because the whole library is filled with it. As soon as she started growing breasts, all the old people from the neighborhood started gathering around their stall. She hates it. She has to stand here for another year and a half, but this is where she met the man she was looking for. She tells us about when she first learned about Kosaku Asamori. She was 14. She didn't know what she was reading, but his prose was tender, beautiful, perfectly matched with his aggressive content. It made her forget about her dull life and ugly body. Kosaku walks up to the counter and holds out the item he wants to buy. Chiako asks to pay for the item. She is shocked to see that Kosaku himself is in their store. He gives the perfect amount, no change, and then leaves. He moves away from the counter, but Tiako asks him to wait. She thanks him for the purchase. She has changed her mind. She wants to go on a diet when she gets in lose weight, become one of the city girls. She doesn't want him to see her like that. One of the old men asks her if she's going to go to Vita. She says she will. And he tells her to find a good husband in Tokyo and clean up the place as a thank you to her father. She runs away. It's creepy. She just can't stay here. It's night. It's dark. She catches up with Esamori and apologizes. She starts a dialogue with him, asking him if he's exploring the area but he only says nothing in response. Then she talks about Spring Casket getting a movie adaptation. She asks him if he's Kosaku Asamori, the novelist. He asks her if she's read his books, and she says she's a big fan. Asamori thinks she's from middle school and asks if she's too young to read his books. Tiako shrieks that she's in high school, but she started reading in middle school. He says she's growing up fast, but apologizes afterward. She asks about the adjustment, Esamori explains that the people who will be filming it will do it. This town is his hometown. She asks why he chose this place, to which he replies that hometown is the wrong definition. He lived here for six years when he went to seventh grade. Now he's back to take care of his parents. That's why he didn't release anything. They see spider lilies, and Esamori talks about what they make you remember. Many of them bloom along the paths of the rice paddies. He realizes Tiako doesn't like them and asks why. She says it's because of their bright red color, and she realizes she's wasted another year of her life here, and how many more times she'll see them God only knows. She calls him Sensei, she says she'll be entering Wazita in a year, and that her dream is to be an editor, and that one day she will be his editor. Asamori leans on the fence and plucks a spider lily. He holds it out to her pulko, and asks her to become one now. Maybe they can write something interesting together. Tayako recalls her own words to Kuroz. He's a bastard, someone to be avoided in real life. Kuroz is still together with the teacher. They look at the phone, where a dialogue with Kuroz's mother is open. She asks what's wrong, and Kuroz replies that it's his mom's way of calling him home. He apologizes for not being able to have dinner with her. The teacher says it's okay, and Kuroz promises her that he'll be back to school on Monday. She tells him about her mother, that yes, he only obeys her because she's his mother, but even if they don't love each other, he has to rely on her. When he grows up, he can leave and go wherever he wants. The teacher promises to be there for him. He thanks her again and addresses her using the abbreviation Sensei, but then apologizes and asks, what should he call her? Sensei, she says, because it would be really bad if they called each other by their first names at school. Kuroz promises that won't happen. Sensei says nothing will change, she'll be his teacher, and she'll be alone. After all, he's such a charming high school student. She wants to secretly enjoy the dangerous teacher-student relationship. She asks to be called the same name as before, because when he graduates, 
It will all just end. Kuroz asks her if she's okay with that. That's what she wants. He'll understand when he's older. Even now it doesn't seem to make sense. He walks home, the cold wind wrapping around his body. Kuroz's cell phone rings with a call from Tayako. He answers and apologizes for not answering. She tells him not to worry, but also mentions that he was acting weird last time. She asks if everything is normal. He replies that everything is normal. She wanted to tell him about their meeting with Esamori, but changed her mind. Kuroz realizes that she sounds happy, and something good must have happened. Ta says it's not amazing, but delightful, and then says goodbye to him. He says he's leaving town too. He returns home, where he is greeted by his mother. He brings the chicken and his mother thanks him for it. She says that she made curry, something that Kuroz likes. Kuroz's mom notices that his clothes are completely washed. She thinks she should call and thank them for doing so much for them. Kuroz says not to and afterwards apologizes for not coming home yesterday. She smiles and says that today they can finally eat, watch TV, and sleep soundly that's all fine, right? Night. A convenience store. The idle girl, Nagi, has been fired. I mean, last time she ran off with some guy. They say they didn't really recognize her because she doesn't look like a local and that they're obviously not from around here. The bully who controls Kuroza's life comes up behind her. He calls her over and asks her for a light. What happens next?